I'm Tobias Berg. I'm a professor for finance here at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And this latest paper, joint work with Yasmin Gida from Bonn, is about bank leverage. And bank leverage is essentially about the way that banks finance their loans and other assets. So they can be either financed with equity or with debt. So let me give you an example, maybe. If you look at Deutsche Bank and the balance sheet of Deutsche Bank, then they have total assets, so loans and other assets, of roughly 1.6 trillion. And that is financed with 65 billion equity, and the remaining part is debt. Okay, so if you divide equity by total assets, you get a ratio of 4%. Okay, only 4%, the other 96% is debt. So that implies if the assets of Deutsche Bank lose in value by only 4%, that the equity is fully wiped out. And that would usually require Deutsche Bank to either file for bankruptcy or, as we've seen many, many times since the financial crisis, to file for government support. Okay? So, in short, bank leverage is a really important question in academia and for regulators because the amount of equity that banks use to finance their assets is really important for the losses that they are potentially able to absorb in, in times of a crisis. So Deutsche Bank with the 4% equity ratio is uh, even an outlier among banks. So the average bank in our sample, we look at a 50 year period roughly, is 10%. So banks on average use 10% equity funding and 90% debt funding. Now if you look at non-banks or so at any other firms, then they use on average 50% equity and 50% debt. So that is a huge gap compared to the capital structure or leverage of banks. And academics have wondered for quite a time, what are the drivers of, of this difference? Why is the average leverage between banks and non-banks so different? Okay? And there's a very simple narrative that many academics and some regulators have put forward, and that is it's all or almost all due to the government safety net. Okay? So banks without any doubt profit from a government safety net that comprises, for example, deposit insurance. So deposits are guaranteed usually by a deposit insurance fund and or the government. They have access to the discount window at the central banks and in particular larger banks also profit from their too big to fail status. And all this combined, which we call the government safety net, implies that debt financing for banks is subsidized. It's cheaper than it otherwise would be, and that encourages banks to lever up. Okay? And a common narrative has been that this government safety net explains a large proportion of this difference between bank and non-bank leverage. And this is something that we question our paper. And we do not argue that this doesn't exist. It surely exists, the government safety net, and it surely distorts leverage decisions. But we found another factor, independent of the government safety net, which is actually responsible for roughly 90% of the difference between bank and non-bank leverage. And this single factor is asset risk. So why is asset risk so crucial in explaining the difference in leverage between banks and non-banks? Let me explain that in three steps. The first step is, what is asset risk? Under asset risk, we understand the riskiness of a business model of a firm. So if you, have a, if you have a very low risk business model, like grocery shop, for example, there's a very low risk that cash flows or earnings or the value of your assets will significantly decline from one year to the next. So that is asset risk. Now, the second step is why is asset so important? Why is asset risk so important for leverage decisions? And there's a very simple reason for that. Firms usually try to avoid that they come in a state of financial distress because that has many negative consequences. And if you have a very low risk business model, you can afford to have a very high leverage, low equity and a lot of debt and still not risk coming into financial distress. So that's the reason why asset risk is so important for leverage decisions. Now the third step is the question, what's the difference between asset risk of banks and non-banks? And our research shows that the asset risk of, bond, of banks is significantly lower than the asset risk of non-banks. And that might sound surprising to some at the beginning because many of us think about banks as kind of being very, very risky entities. 
But if you purely look at the asset side first, then banks actually have a very, very low risk business model. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. Deutsche Bank in 2015 posted a loss of 7 billion. As an absolute number, 7 billion euros is a huge number. But relative to the assets of 1.6 trillion, this is a meager 0.5%. Even the whopping loss of Merrill Lynch, record loss during the financial crisis in 2008 of 28 billion, was only 4% of their total assets. For non-financial firms, we frequently see losses in excess of that. If you, for example, look at Deutsche Telekom back in 2002, losses exceeded 10% of their total assets. Okay? Now, these are simple empirical numbers. What's the concept, concept underlying that? So let's look at what banks are actually doing. An important part of the business model of banks is actually to grant loans to firms. Now, let's start with the firm. It could be bakery shop or it could also be Siemens or General Electric. So these firms will have a certain riskiness of their business model. And the risks and also the rewards, obviously, of this business model are split between equity holders and debt holders. Equity holders usually get a higher return, but they also be a higher risk and debt holders have a lower risk and also a lower return. Now banks, the asset side of banks, consists exactly of these lower risk portion of the liability side of firms, the debt. Uh, so they are providing loans to firms. And therefore it's obvious that banks should have a much lower asset risk than non-banks. So why it's surprising at first, it's both conceptual and conceptually and empirically very, very clear that the riskiness of the assets of banks is a factor of five, five to seven lower than that of non-banks. Okay? And if you take these three steps together, asset risk being very important for explaining leverage decisions and banks having a much lower asset risk than non-banks, you derive at a simple conclusion. And that is to a certain extent, the difference between leverage of non-banks and non-banks is not explained by government safety nets only but also by factors like asset risk. And when we do that in a quantitative exercise, we find that asset risk explains roughly 90% of the difference in leverage between banks and non-banks. I think the most important implication for our research uh, links to the current discussion on equity capital requirements for banks. There's been a long and intensive discussion since the financial crisis on how much equity capital banks should have and also about the structure of these equity capital requirements. And our research simply suggests that comparing banks to non-banks in an unconditional way is probably not the right benchmark. So simply saying, look, non-financial firms without the government safety net also use 30, 40, 50% equity doesn't imply that banks should have the same amount of equity capital. Okay? So I think this is one important implication that you shouldn't simply take the benchmark for, for non-financial firms as the benchmark for banks as well. The other implication refers to the structure of equity capital requirements. There's an intense discussion whether we should require banks to have equity as a proportion of their total assets or of their risk-weighted assets. So risk-weighted assets means that first of all you assign a risk weight to each of these assets. So cash would get a very low risk weight and maybe risky loan to a hedge fund would get a very high risk weight. And there have been pros and cons kind of for both camps, these unweighted leverage ratios and these risk weighted ratios. And our research suggests that kind of in absence of government guarantees or as we see it for non-financial firms, that asset risk is really a crucial driver of what the market allows firms to, to lever up. Okay, and this suggests that at least we should be cautious in fully decoupling equity requirements for banks from the underlying riskiness of the assets. Yeah, what is next? Uh, I think uh, that question uh, has kind of two answers, depending on whether you talk about the academic, academic area or the regulatory area. Uh, let me start with the academic area. I think uh, in the academic area, our research should hopefully be fruitful to combine research on corporate finance and banking. Currently, we have a lot of silos of people doing research about corporate finance, other academics doing research in banking. Uh, 
And I think it's very fruitful to combine these two areas because interesting findings emerge out of this. From a regulatory point of view, I think the message is still quite simple. Even after controlling for asset risk in our scenarios, banks are still higher levered than their non-bank peers. So as I said, 90% of the difference we can explain with something like asset risk, but there's still room for the remaining part to explain by something like government guarantees, which surely play a role. So even our research would suggest that the current levels of equity capital in the banking industries and the industry are too low. So therefore, I think for regulators, there's still kind of a similar message to what we already have out by other academics, and that is an increase in capital requirements relative to the current level is most likely to be very beneficial to society.